Yes. It's nice to see you, you and nice to be here. And you've been talking to some important people. I want to say, share, have you share that with us. And so good to see you. Thank and you. Uh, wel welcome. Welcome very much to Conversation. Pleasure to welcome to the program uh, Norton Mizminski, PhD, his distinguished professor of history, particularly the Middle East. Been a guest many times in the past. He's a dear friend of mine, a friend of the world. And Norton, it's so good to see you again. It's nice to see you, Harold, as well. Nice well, to be here. We've done a number of programs with you over the years and so forth. And now we're talking on this uh, May 29th of 2008. And you've been really very busy. And we're going to want to catch up with what you've been doing. Uh, but I wonder, could you just briefly share your background a little bit? And then we'll wade into it that way. And then we want to get down, particularly this way you say things perhaps talking a great deal about uh, Syria and other things, but could you share briefly your own background for the audience? Yes, I deal with the Middle East mm. uh, primarily. I deal with American policy in the Middle East. I deal with Arab-Israeli conflict. I've written on Zionism, as you know, quite mm. a bit. With I, Israel Shahak. With Israel Shahak, uh -huh. that's right. And uh, I finished a book on, I'm fi finishing just now, a book on Christian Zionism. Yeah. And I also, in addition to my academic work, I also teach those subjects in Connecticut at the university, uh, as well as write about them. And I also have done for decades now, and I'm still doing, uh, political work that's connected with or concerned with, within the context of uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, mm -hmm. primarily. Uh, is that, that, that's not in any kind of a way working with uh, the State Department or any official no, capacity. No, it's no, It's unofficial and it's so It's unofficial. Forth, but you've met a great number of the interesting, as they say, players that are relevant to that. Over the years, uh -huh. over quite a while, Harold, yeah. almost half a century, yes. uh, I've met uh, a good many people, including uh, a number of what we could call, and you have, major players. Uh huh, uh huh, and that continues, and it seems to be even picking it up. It does continue. Uh huh. So, uh, more recently, over the last year or two, maybe you could bring it up to date. What you've been involved? Well, I would say if we phase. take the last year in mm -hmm. terms of meeting people and being with people, uh, I would say that probably um, uh, the top example would be I have seen and spoken with one-on-one -on -one, uh, President Bashir Assad. Of Syria, a major player. He is a major player. Uh huh. And yes. you've had long uh, discussions or short? Long or? discussions. Uh huh. First over time I saw him. Ever or that kind uh, of thing? Not or? over dinner, uh -huh. but uh, over an hour's time. Oh ho, that's real. Yeah. That's right. And uh, when when first did you have a meeting with him, and what was the? Uh, I had a meeting with or him. The agenda and so forth. I have a I had a meeting with him a year ago in March. Mm hmm. And uh, it was um, something that was set up by um, Imad Mustafa, who's the ambassador of Syria to the United States. You're well acquainted with him. Yes, I'm well acquainted with him. I've brought him twice to my university. Oh, good. I've been with him a good many times in Washington. Uh, we've worked together, and we also have become good friends. Ambassador Mustafa is a very well-known figure. He's in the media a great deal. And he's he very erudite. He's, he's and very, yes, well, yeah. he is an academic. In yes. fact, um, the first and only to date political position or job he's ever had mm -hmm. is as the ambassador to the United States. That's pretty high level. Uh, that's right. right Bashir Assad, the president, decided to make him the ambassador. Uh, before that, he was an academic, a professor at Damascus University, mm -hmm. and he comes from an academic family. And he's also got a great understanding, if I look at his bio briefly, of cybernetics and things uh, Oh, computer. that's right. Oh, yeah, that's he, right. He that's was involved a, in that. He's a, a distinguished person in, in that. Uh-huh. And he helped um, go, uh, put the meeting with uh, Mr. Assad together? Yes, he's uh -huh. the one who actually uh, arranged it. Good deal. That's good. And I heard you say friend. He's a friend of mine. That's well. important, that that's, there be friendships and correct. trust and that kind of thing that that's can build important. up with people, and you've been able to do that. I know you did a lot of things with Cyprus. You were involved I, in I, that. I, I still do similar. things with Cyprus. Uh -huh. I still do things. I was in Cyprus uh, just this past March uh -huh. at a conference and also 
Uh, they were very good to me at Eastern Mediterranean University, which is the major university on the campus. They were nice enough to award me with an honorary doctorate. Another in honorary relations. doctorate, how wonderful. You're a distinguished professor at the University <laughs> of California. I, well, I spell that, you say yes. it, it is really a distinguished professor. They call it um, Connecticut State University professor. It is the most distinguished. Yeah, the, congratulations on that. That well, was a relatively it's recent. Humbling. Have, uh, it's humbling. Well, all right, that's good, good for you. I'm glad you've got that. Now, could you talk to me a little bit about you, you've known uh, Ambassador Mustafa longer than you've known, or the, before you had the meeting with Mr. Assad himself. Oh, yes, that's but, correct. But uh, you've known him. How did you come to know him? It might be worth, because he is a, as you say, particularly in media terms, a major influence. I'll in terms tell you of how it's an interesting content. story. A yeah. couple years ago, I was going to a conference in Damascus. Mm -hmm. And to go to Syria, you need to have a visa, and you need to get it here in the United States before you go. Uh -huh. You can do it by mail. Mm -hmm. So I made out the form that I got on the Internet. Mm -hmm. I sent the form in, mm -hmm. and a couple days after I sent in the form, I received a telephone call from Ambassador Mustafa. Uh -huh. Uh, and because you put the, your telephone number on the form, yeah. and he called me and he said, listen, he said, you don't know me, but I know you and I know your writings and I respect you and I see you're going to Syria. Uh -huh. And he said, I've told my consul mm -hmm. that whenever an academic mm -hmm. applies for a visa, mm -hmm. I want the consul to bring it to me so I could <laughs> see, so I'm calling you. What can I do for you? But that makes it very interesting in the sense that it makes one want to trust a man who takes that kind of a position. That's correct. Particularly toward academics and people who really That's know what correct. they're talking about. So That's he calls, encouraging. So I said to him, well, I'm leaving in just about a week, and there's nothing that you really um, need to do or could do on this trip, mm -hmm. but uh, let's plan to meet when I come back. Mm -hmm. I'll come to Washington. Okay. So then I went to Washington and we met. And at my university, I plan and coordinate a major Middle East lecture series. Okay. And I invited him the coming academic year to come to my university to uh, lecture, and he kindly accepted. So he came, so that started the relationship. That was a, a couple years ago? Yes. Yeah, okay. And when he came to my university and we had a chance to talk more in depth, he then proposed the idea of my going to Syria. He said, I think it would be a good idea. I can plan your trip. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, you should give lectures. You should appear on TV. You should talk about your work. I said, I'd be glad to go. Good. And so uh, we arranged it, and he really made the arrangements. Mm -hmm. And then a few weeks before I left, he called me and he said, I didn't want to tell you this until I'd done it, but he said, you also have an appointment with President Assad when okay, you're there. fantastic. And you'll meet with him one-on-one. -on -one. One so that's time. how it came about. Well, you go back to the original meeting with the ambassador. Yes. You went to Washington. You had talked on the phone briefly. We talked you on the phone. Can you set it up as they say, like, say, a movie scene? <laughs> was it a, was it was it over dinner? Was it that kind of thing? Was no, it, I went to the embassy. Okay. I went to the embassy. And uh, we had a long talk at the embassy. Hour or more? Um, well, we talked, uh, yeah, for an hour. And then I came back the second time soon thereafter. To Washington. And he invited me to lunch. Okay, good. And he had me to lunch mm -hmm. uh, at his residence. Mm -hmm. And That's so very good, uh, yeah. we were at the residence and we were at lunch together. And I'll tell you one of the things he told me, which is Please interesting, do. which is this political. Is, yeah. Um, uh, we sat down and I said, look, let me start with a question. I think I know the answer to it, mm -hmm. but it will be... This a, is in the second meeting. Yeah, this will right. be a conversation opener. We'll get back opener. to the first meeting. But no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So yeah. I said, mm -hmm. this will be a conversation right. opener. Mm -hmm. I said, um, uh, have you had any talks with the State Department? Because mm -hmm. I knew that President George W. Bush mm -hmm. had... We have a large staffed embassy, we the United States in Damascus, mm -hmm. but um, uh, Bush decided uh, to withdraw the American ambassador, and although Syria has their ambassador here fully recognized, we do not not have an ambassador there. So I said to Ambassador Mustafa, have you had any conversations with That's the State, State Department? Yeah. And at that time, it's changed since. 
At that time, he said no, but he said, I'll tell you an interesting story. Mm. He said one week ago mm -hmm. at the same table, that's mm. the dining room table, yeah. he said to dinner, I had a friend of mine come mm. who's a, uh, an Arab American but a friend. He happens to work in the State Department, but mm. he was coming not as a State Department person. He was mm. coming as a friend to dinner. Mm -hmm. And at dinner, my friend said to me, look, I have an unofficial message for you. Okay. What's the unofficial message? Mm -hmm. The unofficial message was, if you, Ambassador Imad Mustafa, mm -hmm. will cease going to universities to speak, will cease appearing on television, will cease making public statements, then we in the State Department will consider having a conversation with you. Good now, grief. what Good does grief. that tell you, well, it mm -hmm. tells you something pretty negative, it I think, sure does to about me, our yeah. government. Of course, he refused, mm. but that was uh, the story. Yeah, told. okay, that's very interesting. Uh, why did uh, Mr. Bush recall the senator from Iraq? Uh, from oh, the Syria? ambassador. Ambassador from Syria? Uh, well, because he decided that, uh, he, he didn't say Syria was one of those three countries yet within the axis of, of evil. You. But he said it borders the axis of, of when evil. When did he do that? Do you remember? Uh, yes, he did it uh, at the time, uh, I think now three years ago, when uh, Harari, the, uh, yeah, uh, the Lebanese uh, uh, president, was assassinated. Yeah. And there were rumors, which there still are, mm. that the Syrian government was involved, never been proven. We don't have any evidence for this. Uh, president Bashir Assad denies it. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is an investigating uh, commission of the United Nations. Uh, that commission has not made this allegation straight out. But anyway, uh, Bush seemed to be acting on that. He seemed to be acting on that. And that, so uh, Syria that, yeah. became, and Syria has relations with Iran and yes. has relations yes. with Hezbollah, the group in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And so for President Bush, that made and makes Syria some kind of uh, pariah. Pariah. Uh, I mean, a state mm -hmm. uh, that's either a terrorist state yeah. or a state that is uh, aiding and abetting terrorists. Uh -huh. There was that invasion or that war that took place in '06 and so forth. Was it in that context the the Israelis and the and the Hezbollah were in combat? For a long number of days, there was bombing Well, no, going this on. was before that. Before he did that. this a year and a half before. Well, or that two might years have been before. some people. Were two thinking, years before. Some people were thinking that it was all being. No, set no, up and so it. we haven't had, but it's uh, uh, it's rather amazing. Uh, we have a fully staffed embassy in in Damascus. In Damascus, with a charge day affairs, no ambassador, mm -hmm. and this state. Uh, which is called, really, by President Bush, a terrorist state. Syria? This state, yes. Uh -huh. This state uh, still has, it's called a rogue state. Okay. That has connections to the, to the terrorists, but as Imad Mustafa often has said to me and to others, and publicly in writing, on television, on radio, mm -hmm. he said, um, uh, this is the only uh, rogue nation state, so labeled by the President of the United States, mm -hmm who has a fully authorized and fully accepted ambassador in the United States. And he's that's, the ambassador. Yeah, that, 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 that's really interesting. That's really interesting. How, how, does, does that amount to um, uh, non-recognition that they withdrew the ambassador? We have, a, we have, we Where have, does that stand? The answer to that, Errol, the, we have a phrase in Yiddish that yeah. gives an okay, answer Okay, good. That. And the phrase in Yiddish is, Gott weiß, God knows. Uh, oh, really? Okay, because it's up in <laughs> so the air. So we don't know. Are right. there other countries that are in that kind of a thing where they recalled the ambassador and left the embassy staff and uh, charged the affair and so forth? Not I mean, somewhere. I uh, that's not young, to, not, it's not, a unique situation it's to unique. Syria. It's unique. And of course, Imad Mustafa, as you noted when we opened this program, mm -hmm. uh, he is uh. Um, the Arab ambassador that is probably most seen on television, yes. most called by all the television networks. Uh, he has, he overworks in terms of uh, going to universities to speak. He's one of the most able. And let me also point out that he has a very good and very close relationship with the very large Syrian Jewish community in Brooklyn, 
Uh, those people regard him as, an amb as the Syrian ambassador. They have him come to their bar mitzvahs, to their weddings. Really? He does that, but... Here he is. Isn't that Natura Carta people or Sadmar? No, no, or, no, they aren't Natura Carta. There are probably 50,000. Really? They're 50, Syrian a Americans. Lot. Syrian American and, Jews. Uh, they're Jews. Yeah, yeah, and okay. Most okay. of them live in Brooklyn. Uh huh. And uh, he's very close with them. Uh huh. Well, that's really very what interesting. What does that tell you? Uh, okay, back to that thing then. Back to the meeting, let's say, I would have said, did you hit it off right away as soon as you went to that first meeting in Washington? Hit with the it ambassador? off right away. He's an erudite fellow. He is. And he's well informed and he's everything. Well he's informed. read your material. And he fortunately likes me. That uh, always helps. That does and help. I, and I like him. That, so that's very, are. very, yes. that's very important in terms of these things, particularly when it's well enlightened and well thought through and understanding what the. And he's very enlightened. He's very bright. Very enlightened. And, and very uh, bright. A, a major. Uh, a major spokesman for Syria, and that's a very important part of the world. Yes, and he's very well received in this country, mm -hmm. um, everywhere he goes. Okay, that's really good. And that, that was from the get-go, you had that first meeting, and then you went back and so forth. Now, could you talk a little bit about the meeting that he helped arrange with the president of Syria? How that came off, how did you find that, and what were you, was there an agenda, or was it just to get to know one another, that kind of thing? Um, well, yeah, that's a major event no. that you've had such a long talk we did with such not, an important person. There was nothing specified mm -hmm. for the agenda, but obviously <coughs> we were going to talk about uh, Syria, the United States, Israel, mm -hmm. Arab-Israeli conflict, which we did mm -hmm. for well over an hour. I must say that I uh, thought that, well, maybe I'll have a 15 or 20 minute meeting with yeah. him at most. Yeah. But... Um, uh, when I flew to Damascus and I got off the plane, I was met by a couple people in the government. Uh -huh. And the first thing they told me was, your very first meeting is tomorrow morning. I came in in the very late afternoon. They said, your first meeting is tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. With the president. With the president. Yeah. And so a car came and picked me up. Yeah. And we went to the we went to one of his residences, mm -hmm. which is just outside of Damascus, he must meet people there. Mm -hmm. It's a big house, and it sort of is up there, hills or mountains behind Damascus. Mm -hmm. So we drove in, and mm -hmm. this impressed me right away. The car comes up to the front door, and before anyone opened my door, before I opened the door of the car, the door of the house opens. Out comes President Assad himself. He opens the door of the car. Uh, he offers his How hand. How welcoming. And yeah. Now, that's yes, a welcome, yes, right? Yes, it is and right. So we then uh, sat down and we had a conversation. Uh, and in the room, uh, th there were three people. President Assad, myself, and he had... Interpreter? An interpreter, but uh. he did not need an interpreter. He's fully fluent in English. Right. After all, he... He is an uh, ophthalmologist, and yes, he was trained right. in England. He uh -huh. was trained in England, uh -huh. and I must say that during the hour, hour and fifteen minutes that we spoke, he only one time asked the <laughs> interpreter for a word. I forget what right. it was, yeah, but uh -huh. he talks English perfectly well. Okay. So mm -hmm. we were in the room, and we had this conversation, and we, I must say, talked about a whole variety of things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, possible dialogue or talk between Israel and uh, Syria at the highest level. That's Prime the Minister now, Omer, yeah. Prime Minister to mm -hmm. uh, the President. Uh, what are the possibilities? What are the issues involved? The Palestinian issue, the Golan, Golan Heights. Yeah. Uh, we talked about that. We talked about the United States and Israel, or the United, we talked about that. We talked about the United States and Syria mm -hmm. relations. We had a very good conversation. Okay, that's really that's really very good. Had uh, I'm, I got my dates mixed up a little bit, had uh, Israel yet attacked that center no, that they was thought was no. an atomic? Uh, no, no, no. That's very recent. Mm -hmm. They had not done that. They had not done that. They've done that. Uh, they had done uh, that with Iraq recently. Uh, back in 1981. Oh, they did it with Iraq, but they hadn't done it with Syria. Okay, because that was a major event, was it? No, not? that's no, right. But yeah. of course. Uh, uh, we cannot really equate them because with Iraq, it was indeed the beginning of a nuclear reactor plant. In Syria, um, uh, uh, the Israelis never even said that directly. The United States government has said it. The Syrians have totally denied it. Mm -hmm. And I must say that the story of mm -hmm. it, um, uh, let me understate, 
mm -hmm. provide, uh, gives us, provides uh, great doubt about whether that could have been a nuclear reactor plant. It was a building out in the desert. There, was, there were no armaments around the building at all. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, there uh, was nothing that had been built for a water supply, which you have you to have, have to for have, a nuclear yeah, yeah. reactor plant. Right, right. Uh, Imad Mustafa has told me, listen, uh, it was uh, and had been a kind of military base. Mm -hmm. He said, after all, um, uh, Israel is concerned about us militarily. We're even more concerned about Israel With militarily. good reason. They violate so airspace some, that's regularly. That's right. So it has, it had some ammunition, but, but not a nuclear plant whatsoever. I wonder if I could ask a side issue in that sort of thing, because you, as you know, I'm interested in the country of Libya and everything, yes. but, uh, but uh, the idea that um, in 81 when they did that, that was an atomic reactor that was producing electricity. And it was a thing. Why, why is there the idea that a country, let's say, in that part of the world or in any part of the world, uh, should not have the ability to create electricity using electric power? And why is it that, I mean, using atomic power, and why is it that some countries seem to think that it's okay for some countries to have, just say, even at that level, just electricity generation, anything along those lines, whereas some countries are able to, and what does that say about the uh, gradient of power or the way in which the people who have power on their side see those who do not and want to make sure that they never can have anything that might challenge those that have the power? Here's the answer of the United I mean, States. That, on the atomic issue. Here is the answer. Why the hell were they able to bomb a generating yeah, plant right. that was producing electricity and get away with it? Here with is alacrity? the clear United States government answer. Mm -hmm. Any country that the United States government likes can develop nuclear power and the United States helps it, whether it's for domestic reasons or m maybe whether it's even for weapons. The prime example is Israel, but more recent example is India. We've helped. Yeah. Pakistan has developed nuclear power. Pakistan is an ally of the United States. It's all right. But if it's a government the United States doesn't like, that's an enemy country, there's no way that enemy country should be able to develop any nuclear power whatsoever. So it's all on the, from the point of view of the United States government, it's all on the like or dislike of the United States government. That's a hell of a note in a well, certain way that, yeah, that's uh, and the then they answer. also they define what are the enemy states and rogue nations they use this language to do to propagandize and build that propagandize look let me get back to syria for a minute all then. right I, by to all tell means. you how ridiculous it is uh. apart on a much lesser level mm. than um uh terrorism uh or uh, or uh, nuclear power uh, we have, from the United States government, we have travel <coughs> warnings about going to Syria, that it's a very dangerous place to be. Uh, it's a very dangerous place to be. That, that, that's in the warnings. It's dangerous to be there, dangerous to walk the streets, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. Yeah. Syria is a very safe place to be. I know. The crime rate is very low. Most people don't lock the doors of their houses. Really? They huh? don't lock their cars. Mm -hmm. the, as I said, the crime rate is low. It's a very friendly place. Well, that shows you. Yeah, I've been there. I found it that way. I mean, yes, Syria right. found that way. You know, so it's a convenient kind of thing that they do. But I mean, that, that seems to me they were able to, and then they were able to do it again. And, the, and then they also have this idea of dual use. So if they say, if they're, if they're going to take that attitude toward uh, another country, another people, and they say dual use, you might have something that, something that is a fertilizer or something you're doing that might be able to be made into something that could become a weapon, then they can deny even the process of just elemental economic development to anyone because it might possibly lead to a weapon, and that dual-use idea is one that we ought to be aware That's of and the, guard against. That again gets back to the difference between a government that the United States government likes and a government that the United States government does not like. Okay. That is, likes or does not like for valid reasons or invalid reasons. Right. 
How many countries are there that the government, I mean, there, there are countries that are on the terrorist list or something. They, I think they had uh, Mandela down as a terrorist for a while when he was in prison. That kind of, how many countries are there that are on that list of uh, countries, as you put it, we don't like? I, I don't know offhand, but... Might be interesting to... Uh, and it also, it, it, also, uh, it also changes. After all, we have a major change within the last 20 years, let us say, yeah. and that major change is Iraq and Saddam Hussein. Uh -huh. uh, during the 1980s mm -hmm. and right up to the end of the guy. 1980s, yeah. while there was a, uh, through the 80s, an eight and a half year old, eight and a half year long war Horrible. between Iran and Iraq, Horrible. and we armed Iraq, mm. and we armed Saddam Hussein, and if we come to the George Bush Senior Administration, mm -hmm. right up to six weeks before Desert Storm. 91? That's right. George yeah. Bush sent a team from the White House over to Congress to try to convince Congress to extend credits so that, uh, so that credits that were being used by Saddam Hussein to buy arms, and the argument was, we need Saddam Hussein as Again. a buffer against Iran. And then Khomeini? all of the sudden, Khomeini? yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And then all of the sudden, because Saddam Hussein decided to go into Kuwait, all of the sudden, it changes totally, and Saddam who beco becomes, quoting George Bush Sr., as bad as Adolf Hitler, yeah. we then go the other way. Listen, Saddam Hussein was an assassin, mm -hmm. and Saddam Hussein was the same in the 1980s as an assassin, as a leader, mm -hmm. was the same then uh, when we were arming him as he was later when we fought a war against him. Yeah, so it's all So a that's a prime example uh -huh. of how the same place can be a friend and then an enemy. Yeah, and it's all based without of, change. It's a, it's the enemy du jour or something, that's, and it changes. Right. It's like a menu or something. That's it changes right. that kind of thing. It's the enemy of the day. I that's remember right. seeing Jude Winiski, and I did a thing with Nita Renfrew and everything. She'd written a definitive book on Saddam Hussein, and Jude Winiski had written a piece. He didn't know why um, Saddam Hussein was in the dock at all because the cause is Bella really was um, he was a, the elected president of a country. And the cause is Bella was slant drilling by Iran. I mean, by the, by uh, Iraq. Uh, the, the 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 thing like that. The the charges of uh, mass murder and so forth that they made had a hard time being found in terms of real evidence uh, of that. Well, there was some of the Kurds, and when I called them an assassin. Well, the Kurds were uh, uh, when they they were a fifth columnists for the Iranians when there was a war with Iraq. Well, all right, but there was still some mass killing, but I called him an assassin uh, because uh, it was very clear that Saddam Hussein uh, would at times kill people who disagreed with him politically. We've done even that. Even members of his own family. We have well, done that. Well, we wait. have done that ourselves. I don't have we not? Yes. Since uh, Shakespeare did talk well, about it well, in old days. I don't, condone, I, I don't condone it for Saddam Hussein. Uh -huh. I don't condone it for the United States government, mm -hmm. and I don't condone it for any other government. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Uh, now, but uh, whose hands are clean? Well, that's true enough. And the other thing we can say is that under Saddam Hussein, we have lots of other uh, aspects to look at. There was another thing about Saddam Hussein that stuck in the craw, and I'm wondering how it fits in because your work with Syria is very important, uh, whether or not because he was giving support to the Palestinians in uh, the West Bank. No question. He was, uh, uh, he was a country that had a large population with revenue. They had fought mightily when they fought in some of the wars leading up to that. He was very strongly, and he was a pan-Arabist, he had that idea in mind, and he had strong uh, critique of the country of Israel and of Palestine, how much are the enemies determined by how much they are uh, vociferous in their um, attitude toward the country of Israel? How much is the country and the existence of Israel and their attitude and their existence have to do with the diplomacy of that part of the world? It has to do a great deal. Okay, thank you. Indicated. Okay, great. Can you say a little more? Can you elaborate a little on that? Does well, that he 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 was seen as somebody who supported the Palestinians? If you were supporting the Palestinians of Yasser Arafat or whatever, 
was that prima facie evidence to be that you're a bad guy in terms of the State Department, the way people see things? And how are we ever going to get to a, a settlement that involves the Palestinians if we have that kind of a, uh, a prejudice against, uh, let's say, the interests of the Palestinians It will themselves? be difficult. And how much does that resonate within the capitals of the Arab, much less the Islamic broader Ummah, the Israeli question? Uh, right. Well, first of all, um, uh, certainly it is a fact mm. of, let's say, the last 60 years. We just had the... Uh, 60th anniversary yeah. of the of state the, of Israel on of the, the one Nakla, hand. Uh, that's right. Yeah, We've had a 60th it. anniversary on the one hand, as I was saying, of uh, the coming into existence of the state of Israel. And on the other hand, or on the other side of that coin, we've had what you just mentioned, uh, the Palestinian word, the Nakba, which is the Palestinian catastrophe, right. which has been caused, um, uh, if not 100%, 95 uh, percent by uh, successive governments of the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. The catastrophe is oppression of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Now, uh -huh. getting to back to your um, uh, multi-layered yeah. multi uh, question. Uh, certainly, um, governments of nation states in the Middle East mm -hmm. and uh, groups and individuals who have been not only helpful to, mm -hmm. but sympathetic to the Palestinians, oftentimes they've been labeled enemies of the United States government. Okay, why? Not, uh, well, now, then we come to the why. Mm. The United States has been uh, the great, and that's almost an understated word, the great supporter of the state of Israel as we know, militarily, economically, and politically, since the existence of the State of Israel in 1948. Why? Most especially, yeah. wait, most especially since uh -huh. 1967, mm -hmm. there's been nothing like it. So that many of the people who have written about this, for example, they talk about the unique relationship between the United States and Israel. If we could ever say, which we really can't uh, uh, in terms of uh, the wording, but if we could ever say unique was an understated term, mm. here it's even understated. There's been nothing like it. Now, in the to history the, of the world, uh, well, or in the modern in world, in the history, certainly there's been nothing like it. Clearly, in the 60-year existence of the state of Israel, and actually, if you look at it overall, mm. no state in the United States has gotten as much help from the U.S. government. Mm as the state of Israel. Yeah. That's why some people have said, listen, Israel has clearly been the 51st state of oh. the United States from the point of view of the U.S. government. Now, uh -huh. you ask the question, why? Why? Yeah. There are two major answers that are given, two major answers. Um, and some people emphasize primarily one, and other people emphasize primarily the other, uh, both acknowledging that, well, maybe both play in. Mm -hmm. The one emphasis uh, is that uh, the United States government, one government after another, has viewed Israel as uh, an outpost of the United States in the Middle East. Of, of the ally of the United States uh, in the Middle East uh, the country we can rely upon, and so uh, there's a lot to be said to the, uh, about that, but that's one reason. The like problem, an outpost of civilization. An, well, an outpost, uh, well, like Fort of Apache out in well, the days of the Indian War. As Wars. defined by the United States yeah. government, uh -huh. but more than that, it's our, it's uh, the country that we can rely upon in the Middle East. Uh, to be brief, the reason why that argument seems to be, seems to me not to be the major reason, as mm -hmm. opposed to a good many people who think it is, mm -hmm. is that if we go back to Desert Storm, mm -hmm. George Bush Sr., the early 1890s, we sent over 250,000 troops over to Kuwait. It wasn't much of a war, but we drove the Iraqis out of Kuwait. Mm -hmm. That, we sent more troops over to do that 
than we had sent troops anywhere in the world since the end of World War II, with the exception of Vietnam, mm. major involvement for the United States. And what did we tell the Israelis? Supposedly, for, uh, for people who make this first argument, our great ally, we told the Israelis, not only do we want you to stay out of it, don't even say anything. Mm. Because if you say something, that might hurt our relationship with our Arab partners in this conflict. Which he had built up that's a considerable right. now, alliance. That's right. Now, yeah. that seems to me to go against the argument that we've been uh, this almost blind supporter of the state of Israel yeah. because we wanted Israel to be our ally. Now, there's another reason. Okay. The other reason is we have had in this country, as you know well, and we've talked about this in previous programs, mm. We've had an Israel lobby in the United States, right. sometimes incorrectly, incorrectly called the Jewish lobby. Mm. It's not the Jewish lobby, even though the people in this Israel lobby are uh, almost without exception Jews. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it doesn't represent all the Jews in the United States, mm. of which there are about six million just mm. under six million. Probably but less through time. Uh, well, all right. But More Jews are but, peeling uh, off. Right. Yeah. But it's the Israel lobby, mm -hmm. and we've had a good many in-depth studies, for example, of lobbying in the United States. We don't have to look at those studies to know how important lobbying and lobbyists, and lobbyists are, Absolutely. but in those studies, it's clear that for decades, the two most powerful lobbies in NRA terms of influence. And APEC. Well, the NRA uh, is almost there, uh -huh. but it's big oil and the Israel lobby. Okay, that's now, the ACAP, APAC. Uh, well, APAC is the is a major of part of it, yeah. is a part of it mm -hmm. in Washington. Mm -hmm. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Mm -hmm. All right, the Israel lobby. Mm -hmm. But now I would say, uh, uh, and I've just. Uh, I'm glad I've completed all this research now. Yeah. I would say that in the past 10 to 20 years, mm -hmm. especially the, maybe the past 10 to 15 years, mm -hmm. we have another lobby that has been, I would say, now. It's even more important and more powerful than the Israel lobby in terms of influencing the U.S. government in terms of Israel, and that's the Christian Zionist lobby. Wow, really? That's right. Really? Even even uh -huh. more powerful. Uh, no fooling. Even more powerful, uh -huh. and in fact, mm -hmm. um, uh, we can cite Israeli prime ministers for the past decade who every year have gone to one of the major conferences in Jerusalem of the Christian Zionists, and each of these prime ministers have said, to these Christian Zionists, and I believe sincerely, you are our best friends mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. And they mean best political friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those prime ministers said our best political friends because of the influence in the United States of the Christian Zionists. Mm. After all, after all, if we have, if the Israel lobby represents in the, they say they represent Jews in the United States. They don't. They only represent a percentage and probably a small percentage. Really? They like to exaggerate. Could you say that Wait again? A minute. They are yes, small percentage? Yes, they represent only a small percentage. But let's say all together, all together we have, let us say now, five and a half to six million Jews in the United States. Okay. If I come to the Christian Zionists, mm -hmm. listen, the leaders, the Christian Zionist leaders, and I'll mm. quote Jerry Falwell here, who passed away recently, yeah. he used to say repeatedly, publicly, mm -hmm. he used to, on television and other places, he used to say, we, the leaders of Christian Zionism, mm -hmm. we represent 100 million Americans. Yeah, I Now, bet. that's an exaggeration. Yeah, 40%. That's maybe. an exaggeration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, when he said 100 million. But I think that I can prove that we're talking about 40 to 50 million Americans. Oh, okay. 40 to 50 million? That's a big Now, block. some people would say, wait a minute, 40 to 50 million, they aren't all doing everything the Christian Zionist leaders do. Mm. That may be true, but it is clear that when the Christian Zionist leaders say, write to the right White House, send in emails, send money, uh, make calls to the White House, go and see your Congress people. It's clear that a great number of the 40 to 50 million do that. 
That is a powerful lobby. It is indeed, and has been, particularly under Mr. Bush. I, I remember Mr. I'm Wolfeson sorry, and uh, Donald Rumsfeld back in the 70s, way back. They were called the lunatic fringe. And Mr. Wolfowitz was talking about invading Iraq back in the 70s. Yeah. They had that pop, uh, 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 mapped out a long time ago. And there was that. So the Israel. And what? why is it, what is there about that that, and by having that that influence, they're able to lobby, and they've been, it's been a very good thing because they've been able to gain from the Treasury of the United States of America, representing the United States of America, many times their investment in terms of the aid that has gone overwhelmingly to Israel, making that country possible. It was a very smart move on their part, and it was a very good thing because they've been look, able to raid our look, treasury to set up their system, look, and they say there's such a link that's so tight, and they've been able to pull it off. But are they not becoming to be in eclipse now as we come into this year, 19, 2008? Well, you say they. You the mean, conservative, the evangelicals, the thing that was the power base, about 40% of the power base of George W. Bush, who is now so unpopular as Truman was in 1948, uh, that uh, you know that it's 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 being eclipsed now, perhaps with the emergence of Obama and other kinds of things. Well, Harold, some people have said that, as you know, and uh, uh, we can refer oh. to some of those people. I would say <coughs> to you that I'm not convinced of that at all. Okay, um, it is true that George W. Bush, who became a certain type of born-again Christian, and mm -hmm. I want to underline that wording, certain type of, all born-again Christians are not the same. Yeah. Jimmy Carter is a born-again Christian. He's a different type. He seems but to George be doing w. things Bush, different. George yes. W. Bush became a born-again Christian at age 39, uh -huh. and George W. Bush is a born-again Christian of this ilk. He's been very influenced by these people. His personal minister has been the son of Billy Graham, mm. Francis Graham, mm -hmm. who is one of the leaders of Christian yeah. Zionism. Yeah. And I could go on and on and on. That's true. But also, we have had and do have a number of people in Congress who are also influenced terribly if they are not uh, totally a part of this context of the... Uh, Christian Zionists that I'm talking about here, that yeah. we're talking yeah. about, the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, not all evangelicals are Christian Zionists. Right. We have a minority grouping of evangelicals who are opposed to Christian Zionism. Oh. But we're talking about a majority of the evangelicals. Now, I would contend that they are still a very strong political force. Yes. Uh, uh, look at, for example, Look at this recent thing we've just had with Hagee, probably yeah, the leading yeah. one now, uh, and, and McCain. Yeah. Now, it's true that McCain finally, uh, finally, or most Distant. recently in the yeah. past couple of weeks, mm. has said, well, he wants to disavow mm. some things that have been pointed out about, about the Catholic Hagee. Church. Yeah. Uh, that's right, yeah. about Hagee, but mm -hmm. McCain playing mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. before that had been seeking him. he not only seeking he went down he publicly sought it and so on yeah and so that was I, primary season uh, that well oh. but uh, listen mm -hmm. i think that it is still they are still an important part and influence in, in especially in the republican party mm -hmm. but now if we go beyond them for example to the whole pro-Israel influence that comes not only from evangelical Christian comes Zionists, pouring out of the but media. From, wait a minute, yeah. but from the Israel lobby yeah. and generally in this country, yeah, generally. and even from mainline churches, yeah. many of them, some are on the opposite side and mm -hmm. have been critical of Israel mainline churches. But if we go to all of that and we look at our current electoral scene, it's no. the same as it has been in previous elections. Oh. If we take the candidates for uh, the Democratic Party candidates in a primary, the Republican candidates in a primary, and then finally the one, the Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate, when we come to that and we have the race, 
each of them, mm -hmm. starting with the primaries, mm -hmm. each of them tries to outdo the other in being pro-Israel in their state. Even Obama, even, even Obama. Even Obama. Even Obama has the, to bow listen, down to that. I'm an Obama supporter. Yeah, me too. But yeah. certainly not on this issue. Mm -hmm. And even Obama, when he read, I listened to the speech that he made mm -hmm. a little over a week ago mm -hmm. at the synagogue in Boca Raton, Florida. Mm -hmm. I listened to it on C-SPAN. Mm -hmm. And I must say, he was going out of his way, clearly, to become as pro-Israel government yeah. as possible. Yeah. Now, I want to be very clear about my wording. Mm. I'm talking about pro-Israel government. Mm -hmm. That means pro-Israel governmental policy. Mm -hmm. He went out of his way to be as fully in favor of that as a person could be. Each of these candidates tries yeah. to outdo the other. Mm -hmm. That has not changed. Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed to date. Now, what does that tell us about the effectiveness of the uh, ad campaign or the campaign for that got such support in the United States public, that they are so in support, and why? What is there about the, uh, the state of Israel or the Zionist enterprise that has been so successful in public relations terms why should we be uh, doing that, particularly in an age where there is a large Islamic world that we have to deal with, and that is a sticking point in much of the Islamic world, and it might be more important than the Israeli influence on world affairs. They have a, Mr. Carter just said they have 150 atomic bombs. They have a narrative that they believe in so uh, so completely, and it, they may be they are a major threat Very in good terms question. of and the possibility of unleashing in, weapons of that's destruction. Right. And then if we they got throw, a million, I got 150 million atomic. Then, and, why do we not call them to task? And then if we throw into it mm -hmm. the American interest in the Middle East because of oil, and absolutely where oil increasingly a hundred dollars right. a barrel and more. That's right. Yeah. Now, now, why do we stick with now. them? What is well, there about it? And what did the Arabs ever do to, de to, to defend having their land taken away from the Palestinians and set up a Zionist state? There Why are, do we support that idea? I would say there are two major reasons that okay. are connected, that overlap, and that go together. Okay. First of all, there is... White man's burden? No, no. Hmm. The effect of the Holocaust has remained. Mm, well, After all, okay. the effect of the... Now, now... Uh, and I, together with a good many Israeli Jews, by the way, uh -huh. think that it's not a good thing at all that the Holocaust has been used as such a propaganda piece to garner support for the state of Israel. But I want to six, pick, oh, six million Jews killed, mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. Six million Jews killed. Mm -hmm. So then the idea that there needs to be some kind of uh, state where Jews are going to be safe, that's had an effect. Well, now, it's a good well, thing to use in an well, ad campaign. Well, yeah. yes, uh -huh. yes, yes. Of course, there's something topsy-turvy about it, because mm -hmm. after all, the Zionist argument has always been that the only place that Jews are safe will be the Jewish Zionist state. That may be where the, the argument. safe. That's right. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. And that state's been in existence for 60 years. And every year when there are drives to collect money for the state of Israel, what's the major argument the Zionists put? They say, help Israel because those Jews living there are living in the most unsafe place for Jews. Yeah. In the world. It can't be the safest and the most unsafe yeah. at the same time. But, it, okay. it but anyway, yeah. that, that, we know that human beings are not always rational. No, that's right. Okay, yeah. fine. Apparently. So I'm saying that there now, now it's been now we're maybe into the third generation since the Holocaust. So maybe that has been lessened some, but it's still there. And now I come to the second point. The second point we started with. The second point is the Israel lobby, which has primarily emphasized this. Now the Christian Zionist lobby, their theological uh, emphasis is far different. But they emphasize this point, too, about the Holocaust. They take up this theme, and what they do is they will point to, and in this country they've had tremendous success, amazingly, and it's really horrible. It's good PR. Had, they're really, they've really got to give But they've them. had amazing success in labeling anyone 
who criticizes any policies of the state of Israel mm -hmm. as being anti-Semitic. Yeah, they've been now, able to pull it now. off, yeah. And there have been, I think this is lessening now. So. I do too, yeah. But there has been this fear by a good many people, church leaders, government people, and others, mm -hmm. the fear of being labeled anti-Semitic yeah. after the Holocaust. Okay, now why would that be? Okay, and, and you gotta give them credit for pulling it they off. Have well, let me ask you something. You're, Jew, you're, you're of a Jewish background. I I'm of a Jewish. wasp background. What? I'm a wasp background. So I'm in a, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. In fact, I'm of a royal descent in the, uh, in the British line. So I'm not exactly a oppressed group uh, in any way. So I just, you're Jewish, right? So I am why Jewish. do we call, why, how has it come and who, who was the PR? I mean, so you had uh, six million and why is the word Holocaust only just without, I always refer to it, the Jewish Holocaust. There have been other Holocausts. Half the population of Libya was wiped out in concentration camps. Look at Darfur. The American Indians what's going on in Darfur, the Middle Passage. Why is it they've been able to put a collar on the idea of oppression and terrible, uh, terrible uh, disaster ra rain down on them? Why don't we say it's the Jewish Holocaust as opposed to others, but they want a, they want a, 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 um, a, uh, tr a Trump. They want to have it be that they represent the suffering that occur has occurred in the world, when in the case, that's not the case. Yeah. There were others. Harold, How have they been able to pull that off, valid, and why have they? You make a valid point. This is not the killing of six million Jews. It's horrible. Yes. It is a Holocaust. It's not the only one that we've had. But they've tried you're, to make it that. Right. Everyone just but, says the Holocaust. Well, they Harold, mean immediately the Jews. Harold, that was a Holocaust. Harold, Harold, you answered it yourself okay. before when you said these lobbies, we have two of them, the Israel lobby and the Christian Zionist lobby, They've done a very good job of propagandizing that. Yes. So much so. So you got to so give them credit. So. It was a great ad so, campaign. That's right. So much so mm -hmm. that at times when people say what we're saying here, there oh. are other holocausts, then those people are attacked for somehow undermining the real Holocaust, according to these people. Well, that's people. the way it is. That's I know right. some people who think the Middle Passage was worse. I know some Amerindians Indians who think what happened to the Amerindians, Indians, particularly on the Caribbean, was yes, worse. Of Much course. worse things have happened. So it's a matter of the effectiveness of the ad campaign they've been able to pull off to have us support, raid our treasury by having all the money go. They would not have been able to do it if it hadn't been for support, massive support, the biggest recipient of aid and underscoring, Apache helicopters, uh, all this kind of thing, looking the other way when you talk about 150 atomic weapons in a country that's wrapped up in a narrative that's very radical and very self-serving and so forth. They may be the da most dangerous country in the world, and we never call them to task at all. And even Mr. Obama gets down and does everything possible to genuflect to that. Is it because that of card, Is it played... because of Jewish power? Or what is it? No, What's no, the reason it's for that? Because they have played this Holocaust card very well. Well, okay. And we can say that these lobbies have been among the most effective of the American lobbies. And look what they've also covered up, not talked about, and won't talk talk about. Uh -huh. They won't talk about. We used this term earlier. They won't talk about the Nakba the catastrophe for Palestinians, uh -huh. which we haven't yet touched upon, yeah. and maybe we'll do another program on, on the Nakba, but the catastrophe. After all, 700 to 750 Palestinians were driven off their land and driven into refugee camps between March and September 1948. That's the original Nakba. The oppression of mm. Palestinians has continued mm -hmm. to the present and time. Continues. The three and a half million living in the West Bank and Gaza are living in horrible, Particularly horrible, Gaza. Uh, horrible oh, the whole, conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Horrible conditions. Mm -hmm. the oppression, it's apartheid. The, that's right. The oppression has come mm -hmm. mostly and primarily mm -hmm. by one Israeli government after another. Yeah, Likud and, and labor. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And, and. The argument, the argument that sometimes we hear indirectly, yeah. if not directly, in the, look, we have been oppressed, I must say, is an argument that upsets me and a good many other Jews mm. personally, mm -hmm. terribly. Mm -hmm. The argument that 
uh, increasing numbers. Totally invalid, totally invalid. Yeah. That is to say, if a people, a group of people has been oppressed, mm -hmm. that certainly gives those who were oppressed no right whatsoever to oppress. Quite the opposite to oppress others, it, it, and they ought to know better. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that number is growing among the Jewish community, I, I think. think. So. I think it is. I think so. And also in a world where the Uma is awakening. awakening. You have, you have 1.4 billion people. And there's a lot of That's people. Right. And yeah. one of the sticking points is this question of the unalterable support for the country of Israel. You visited with the president of Syria. There's a great deal of discussion going on now that's very important and so forth. So what do you see? We've only got a couple minutes left. Unfortunately, we could talk for hours easily. But where does it stand? Why cannot we build better relationships with part of the Arab world? The Arab world may have... have uh, I, and not the Arab, but the Islamic world, might have better ideas that are more appropriate to uh, a well-organized world society than we might think. We're just lumping them all into the other enemy that used to be communism or something, and that may not be serving American interest to have that attitude. And why do we go for it? Well, and why me, even a, a, a candidates like Obama will bow down to that? Well, why? Let me try to, to answer... Golden calf. Let me try to answer this... Uh, uh, as I must well, very got briefly. a minute left. You can start running the craftists too, yeah. Um, uh, we have to hope mm -hmm. that there can be some meaningful negotiations yes. between Israel and Syria, between mm -hmm. Israel and the Palestinians, and we have to hope that in time there will be enough people on both sides and the numbers are growing mm -hmm. on all sides, especially Israeli, Jewish, and Palestinian sides that say we've had quite enough of this, mm. we don't want our children to face this kind of horrible situation mm -hmm. anymore, both sides will have to compromise and they will have to come to an agreement. And let me end by saying that I'm 75 years old, mm. I really think I'm going to live to 120, mm -hmm. but no matter how long I live, I think we'll see a solution to this problem in my lifetime, even though I think in the next year or two or three, it's likely to get worse. Okay, well, thank you for coming in. Thank you for all that uh, outreach to the country of Syria, very important, and also for all your scholarly work, for which you richly deserve distinguished professor status. You're very And kind. we thank, thank you very much for coming in and sharing all this with the audience. Your pleasure, the perceptions, altogether too short, even though it was an hour, we were too short. You only had an hour, Mr. Uh, Assad. You could have had longer, you know. But anyway, uh, thanks for coming in. Your pleasure. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Tune in. Uh, that's it for now. But thanks again, Norton, very much for all your good work over the years. Thank and you. Continues. Really Thank good. You. Okay, we'll be coming back tomorrow. So it goes on and on and on. It's really good you've been able to. You had another meeting with him then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. And good. I'm going to have another one in July. The okay. First week of July. Yeah, Libya is just re-examining their new new sense of relationship because they're not coming through. Our side is not coming through on what had been promised them, you know. And so it's. Um, I think the Arab world. We should be engaging the Arab and Islamic world much more reasonably than we have. I agree. And I think it's colored by that Israeli kind of thing. The uh, colors, because you've got a public relations firm that that powerful, they can influence the That's state right. of the thinking That's of the right. people at large. That's right. Okay, I think we must have, uh, yeah, I must have gone, they just haven't gone to black, but we're, so we're, we're done. Okay. They're going to go to black. That'll be the end of the program. We'll be off the air by then. Okay. okay, thanks. So we Carol, thank you again. Set. Well, always good. And it's really good. If ever that fellow's in town, tell me. Who, Mustafa? Yeah. If ever well, I'll tell you what. I'd like, he may not want to come down to near access what? television. I'd love to do a program. I'll try to see if I can arrange it. Yeah. Sure. He'd love it.